Good morning, uh, and thank you very much for the chance to be with the IAP and to have a <coughs> discussion about a very timely theme. I, of course, the issue of sustainable development and poverty reduction is always timely, but 2015 is an unusual year regarding these two agendas because 2015 is also a year of unprecedented concentration of global negotiations over the themes of sustainable development and poverty reduction. And I want to interweave the analytic issues, uh, analytical issues about sustainable development and science with the negotiating issues because I see these two as coming together in a very particular way in, in 2015. So I was very appreciative of being assigned the topic of science for poverty eradication and sustainable development. And I think the academies of science have a tremendous opportunity and responsibility this coming year and in the future years as this agenda continues to uh, roll out. Let me start with a framing of the socio-political environment in which we're operating because I think it's very important to frame the challenges of science and sustainable development within the real global context uh, that we find ourselves in. And I would emphasize six complex areas of rapid change. Uh, the first is uh, an economic observation that more and more, whether we like it or not, the world economy is increasingly dominated by global scale production systems with global scale technological uh, and uh, standard, uh, per standardized parameterization especially in the information technology, but all through the global production chains. Second, of course, there is very rapid technological change, so rapid that the favorite term in the business schools is disruptive change uh, caused by information and communications technology that is permeating every sector of the world economy. It's not possible to find a single sector that isn't being deeply transformed by the information revolution, by the digital revolution, uh, not only the fact of communications, but the fact of being able to digitize information, whether it's in agronomy, genomics, uh, nanotechnology, material science, communications, finance, entertainment, and so forth. I think there's massive disruption underway. This is possibly disruption for the good, but it also uh, means a, a lot of upheaval socially uh, that is accompanying these changes. Third is the still uh, dramatic demographic uh, change in the world that really marks two very different worlds uh, of demographic change. On the one side, the most uh, rapidly growing region of the world is Africa, and population growth in Africa is proceeding at an astounding rate, uh, a rate that is, uh, in my view, uh, highly threatening to Africa's uh, long-term well-being and short-term well-being. At the same time, population growth has uh, fallen sharply to zero or even negative rates uh, in much of the rest of the world. So there's rapid aging taking place together with population stabilization or decline. So we have two very different demographic realities. And we have a very disjointed global discussion of these realities because you can't summarize the global situation in one phrase as we tend to do, whether it's the world aging population or population stability and decline or population explosion, it depends on which region. But this 
rapid demographic change is leading to tremendous pressures, social, political, economic, environmental. Uh, fourth is a jobs crisis, which is very widespread and I think strongly related to technological change. Uh, of course, the question of technology and jobs goes back 200 years to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and it's a complex uh, question. I think there is evidence that the current advances of robotics, uh, computer-assisted design and manufacturing, and uh, artificial intelligence are leading to a massive uh, loss of jobs uh, in many parts of the world economy right now and leaving a large part of the young population without clear pathways to uh, prosperity right now. And this is another factor of uh, social unrest as well. Fifth, of course, is the extreme environmental crises that are pervasive around the world. The world economy is growing. It continues to grow. Even when we describe the crisis after 2008, it's not really true that there's a global economic crisis in the sense that is often said, because the world economy as a whole has been growing still between 3 and 4% per year meaning a doubling time of one generation, roughly, of around 20 years. But what is absolutely global is the environmental implications of this continued high growth. The quick number to keep in mind is that the world economy is approaching about $100 trillion per year production. It's probably at about $90 trillion right now when measured when you measure output at purchasing power pricing, or in other words, at international prices, we're at nearly $100 trillion of production. This is too much for the world's ecosystems given the current technological patterns. So the environmental crises are pervasive and they are breaking out in every part of the world not only through global climate change, but through local uh, trespassing on the ecosystem boundary conditions. And I'll, of course, say more about that. And then the sixth point I would emphasize is that we're in a period of tremendous geopolitical change as well. The single most important fact is the rise of China to what is either the second largest economy in the world or, or the first largest economy in the world, depending on whose numbers one sees. And with the change of economic uh, might in Asia, also with the, the growth of India, not as dramatic, but still important, the geopolitics worldwide has changed. We're out of the 1945 US-led global uh, agenda. Uh, we have been really out of that agenda for 20 years, uh, but we don't have a good name for the new agenda. Uh, and we are in a different kind of world geopolitically where we need a different kind of governance, uh, new actors, new institutions, uh, a new uh, global set of relations. And I emphasize this because 2015 could be part of that process of creating a new global geopolitical framework like 1945 was. Hopefully we don't need more wars to create new uh, frameworks that are consistent with the, the world uh, geopolitics. These are all challenging conditions, of course. Uh, they mean that there's a lot of disruption within societies and around the world, a need to build new patterns of relations. I would say that the environmental crisis in particular makes all of this exceedingly urgent because many of the other challenges are challenges of political management and economic 
flux <coughs> that are familiar to humanity. Uh, not that we've handled it very well. After all, we're on the 100th anniversary of World War I this year, and that's an example of absolutely calamitous mismanagement of basic diplomacy. But what makes our time unique, <coughs> in my view, or unprecedented, is the environmental crisis. Because we now have, for the first time in human history, a true global scale environmental crisis with no place to run, no answer through migration, no possibility of addressing uh, these issues on a local scale. So global scale change is called for, but we lack the institutions, the mindset, the motivations, and the direction for that kind of global scale change. And I regard I'm not the only one, but I think we've been 40 years trying to find uh, handles for global scale directed change, and we still lack them. Uh, the only global scale institutions we have are markets, and they are highly effective at many things, but they are not effective at addressing environmental crises or uh, the tensions that are arising from them. The proposal on the table at the UN, and my preferred proposal, is that we view sustainable development as our best hope, as an organizing principle for this new era. And what's interesting is that even though this is a not very well understood concept and not one that is embraced uh, on the street uh, or in the general public or by our politicians necessarily, it is one that has been agreed politically on two major occasions in the past 22 years and notably in Brazil both times and giving us a way forward. Uh, in the Earth Summit in 1992, which was the most important single event in recent environmental history, sustainable development was adopted as, an organi as the organizing principle. It did not take hold effectively, unfortunately. Uh, at the time, first of all, it was defined in a way which was not extremely useful. Uh, it was defined by the Brundtland Commission, we'll all recall, as meeting today's needs in a way that enable future generations to meet their needs. And that definition of intergenerational sustainability was very hard to put into practice in an operational sense. So even though the concept was adopted at the Earth Summit, I don't think it sunk in very deeply uh, into the global uh, political and institutional arrangements. 20 years later, in 2012, another important meeting took place in Rio, which was on the 20th anniversary of the Earth Summit. And in June 2012, at the Rio Plus 20 Summit, sustainable development was again adopted by all the world's governments. That's important because even if it's formal, it's a unanimous formal adoption of the concept. This time around at the Rio Plus 20 Summit, sustainable development was given a different definition, and in my view, a much better one, much more operational, potentially. Sustainable development in 2012 was defined as a holistic framework for combining economic, social, and environmental objectives. And so the idea, rather than defining it as meeting the needs today in a way that future generations can meet their needs, which is fine in an intergenerational context. It was rephrased in a much more operational way as balancing economic, social, and environmental goals of society. My experience in teaching sustainable development over the past dozen years as a field and a subject, a major, a PhD, is that that three sector definition works a lot better. That people understand, politicians understand, 
Uh, the general public understands that there are our economic goals, that there are social goals of keeping social cohesion, that there are environmental requirements of protecting ecosystems and stopping human-induced climate change, and that the idea of a holistic framework that unites the economic, social, and environmental is a very intuitive idea. And this is the way that sustainable development was adopted in 2012 as a holistic integration of economic, social, and environmental objectives. And I would say also that sustainable development has two parts to it. The positive or analytical part, which is integrated systems analysis. So to integrate economic, social, environmental, and governance systems at, from an analytical point of view, systems theory, and then a normative framework which says we should have multiple dimensions of our social goals and move, as one expression of it is, move beyond GDP. So instead of chasing just one measure of economic growth, we aim for three dimensions, economic, social, and environmental. We define those dimensions and then we have a multi-objective function problem as a societal problem. How do we invest our resources in society and organize our institutions so that we're achieving all three dimensions, not just the one? And that is really how it was put. At Rio Plus 20, the idea was set to adopt sustainable development goals in 2015. That's one of the main reasons why 2015 is a unique occasion. From the 24th to 26th of September next year, there will be a three-day head of state summit at the UN to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals. It will be the largest gathering of heads of state in history around sustainable development. It's a very important occasion. If these concepts are adopted, and, uh, and embraced, it could make a very big difference in my view. In fact, there are three major summits next year that are all interconnected and all of them quite complicated to bring to success. The first one will be actually in July 2015 in Addis Ababa, which is a conference on financing sustainable development. <coughs> it is, will be the on the 13th anniversary of the Monterey Conference on Financing for Development, which was just after the New Millennium Development Goals were adopted. Governments met in March 2002 to adopt a financial framework for the Millennium Development Goals. It was only implemented in very small part, I have to say, but it was an important meeting in terms of setting a normative framework for international finance. The meeting in July 2015 will be even more important because the financial agenda is even more complex. The question in 2015 will be how to finance the end of poverty and how to finance sustainable development, including financing climate change mitigation and adaptation. So the agenda for 2015 in the finance meeting is really full and deeply underdeveloped, I can tell you. We're here in December. There's no draft document. There's no shared agreement on even the pillars for that outcome. And the traditional donor countries, so-called, of Europe and the United States basically say, don't come to us for any money. They say, we're broke. Of course, that's ridiculous. They're not broke. There's more wealth than ever before, but they just don't tax the wealth. Uh, so they say we're broke as governments. And then the question is, how are we going to actively finance sustainable development? So that will be the 2015 July meeting. Then will be the Sustainable Development Goals Summit that I mentioned. And then the final uh, key meeting of next year is COP21. And so we have COP20 running next door in Peru right now. 
uh, which is uh, preparatory to a successful climate change agreement in uh, Paris, uh, end November, beginning December 2015. Of course, uh, we all know how fraught those negotiations are uh, because we have been 22 years since the signing of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, and we have not yet put in place a workable framework of action. So, and whether Paris will agree on one is anybody's guess, but I'll give you some reasons for optimism of what could be done. Well, this is a huge agenda. It's trying to steer the world. Some people would say it's madness uh, to even think that one can move such a complicated 7.3 billion person, $100 trillion world economy in a chosen direction. My view is we have to do that because what was said 42 years ago in limits to growth has proved to be right, which is that there are limits to the traditional economic model. We've arrived at them and we have to recalibrate a world institutional economic system that reflects those ecological realities. That is extremely difficult to do. There is strong inertia in the socio-political economic system, extremely strong inertia. There are powerful interests. Our politics are all organized around wealth and growth. They're not organized around three agendas. They're organized around one agenda of the three. The momentum is strong. Steering anything in this world is very hard. Uh, anyone in the driver's seat gets shot at by the 7.2 billion people behind them. Uh, so it's very, very hard to steer the vehicle with everybody yelling, go left, go right, go straight, go backwards. Uh, and this is really, in my view, what we face. Uh, can we choose some goals? Can we agree on them? Can we think that it's important to avoid an ecological cliff that is looming ahead? Uh, and can we consciously design institutions and adopt technologies that can get us past this crisis? Now, why do we have any reason to expect success? Some people say we have no, well, a small group of those that are most deeply entrenched in the status quo say we have no problem, just go on as we are. I call that Rupert Murdoch land uh, because that's the message we get from Mr. Murdoch in the United States, in the Wall Street Journal or Fox TV or uh, the government in Australia today or uh, the UK uh, right and so forth. That Anglo-Saxon view, the world's great, just keep going ahead even faster, is a small component of global ideology. But the rest is truly hard, even if we didn't have that kind of confusion and vested interest, how to move a world economy in a direction which preserves the chance for economic improvement but also decouples the economic system from environmental harm is a tremendously daunting scientific and technological challenge. So even if it were a pure uh, optimization exercise, uh, it would still be extraordinarily hard how to take a global energy system and move it from a high carbon to low carbon energy system but still provide the free energy needed to run a modern world economy and do that in real time in the next 30 or 40 years is an extraordinarily difficult and unsolved and unproven challenge. One reason I personally like to think that we have a chance at it is that we're living in a scientific and technological revolutionary age. And I, for one, feel my uh, recommendation to all my economist friends and others is to read at least the, the first half of Science and Nature each week. Uh, that's the readable part for me. Uh, not the individual articles at the, in the second half, but the kind of uh, science this week summaries. 
because every week there's more advance in scientific and technological knowledge per week than was ever true per year or per decade just two or three decades ago. We're in the middle of an explosion of scientific and technological creativity. And I believe that it's right to say that the information revolution is underpinning it in a fundamental way. I don't mean specifically uh, individual devices or even computerization, but what I do mean is the realization of Alan Turing's vision that uh, all information could be long strings of zeros and ones uh, and that this could be true whether it's in material science, in biology, in agronomy, uh, in finance, in entertainment, in communications. That is really playing out. Uh, and the ability to manage bits of information has now improved roughly five billion times from the start of the, uh, the uh, information revolution in 1959 with the first integrated circuit. And so from 1959 till now, uh, from putting one transistor on a chip, uh, Intel now has five billion transistors on its latest microprocessor. And that is a great revolution. Uh, I like to tell my students that it's made possible the absolute pinnacle achievement of humanity that you can now watch movies on your phone. Uh, but uh, even beyond the ability to watch movies on your phone, we may be able to actually solve problems of poverty, environment, and uh, so forth by this advance of information technology. And of course, one example of that is the mobile connectivity, which is now universal. It's estimated that there are 7 billion mobile subscribers in the world now up from some tens of thousands in 1980. And so we've had the fastest diffusion of a useful technology in human history uh, in our generation, and that revolution continues, and I think it's extraordinarily positive. I work a lot in very poor villages in many parts of the world, and the arrival of mobile communications has been positive and transformative. Uh, and it's an example, I, and it's been human genome. The first human genome to be sequenced was, of course, a roughly $10 billion investment. By the time that that sequence had been successfully announced in the year 2000, the incremental cost of, per genome was estimated to be $100 million. At that point, the U.S. National Institutes of Health convened a task force to ask what the goals for genomic sequencing should be, and the task force said it should be a $1,000 sequence by the year 2015, a 100,000 time improvement reduction of cost. That goal was achieved this year. So there was a 100,000 factor improvement in 13 years in genomic sequencing. This is, of course, revolutionizing biology, evolutionary studies, uh, anthropology, not to mention uh, human health uh, and uh, other, uh, and, and veterinary health. And you see here in the straight line Moore's Law rate of decline, which is a doubling or a halving of costs every 24 months. This is a semi-log table. Uh, you can see that the genome sequence has beaten Moore's Law. Uh, which is pretty dramatic, uh, actually, but that's what a 100,000-fold improvement is. So the good news from all of this is that it is empowering a rapid decline of poverty, and the global poverty rate in the developing countries has declined from around 43% uh, headcount poverty in 1990 to probably about 17% today though we don't have the most up-to-date numbers. The most recent number we have is 21% poverty in the developing countries in 2010, and the World Bank will update that estimate next year, and it will probably be about uh, 17%. This means that it's now feasible to think about the end of extreme poverty as a realistic goal. Brazil essentially 
announced such a goal when it had the zero hunger uh, objective and essentially has achieved that. Ending extreme income suffering is within reach. We have to care to do it. We don't necessarily care to do it. We have to be organized to do it. it the technology won't rescue poverty and poverty by itself, but it is within reach to do. And that's why the world will announce as the first sustainable development goal next year, end extreme poverty by 2030. I can guarantee that will be SDG number one. And it's possible to have dramatic progress on related dimensions of poverty, such as under five mortality rates. There still is a massive crisis of under five mortality in the poorest countries of the world, but all, almost all of the mortality is from diseases such as waterborne disease or respiratory disease or unsafe childbirth that are preventable or treatable, but are not prevented or treated because of poverty. And so there's nothing in the health agenda that blocks the way, even today, to a dramatic reduction of mortality rates universally except organization and finance, not known technologies. This is another important point. I've been involved very much in the fight against malaria in the last 10 years. There have been huge improvements of technology, long-lasting insecticidal bed nets, uh, rapid diagnostic tests, new generation artemisinin in combination therapies, <coughs> mobile uh, phone applications uh, used by community health workers. If you take the package together, it proved to be very effective for malaria control in low-income settings, and that's why the malaria death curve has turned down after 2005. If we had a few billion dollars a year of funding, which is nothing out of a $90 trillion world economy except a bit of moral effort, malaria deaths could be brought down to near zero. The big problem with malaria control is lack of adequate finance, not lack of technology at this point. So all of that is good news, but there are two huge barriers to success of sustainable development. One is that there is growing income inequality and social exclusion. And second is there's a looming environmental crisis. So we have a very powerful push from science and technology. We have a growing world economy, but the whole point is that we have an economic model geared towards producing economic growth quite effectively, I would say, on the whole, but not towards ensuring that it is fairly shared or that it is environmentally sound. And that's why sustainable development is so crucial. It requires a change of the normative framework for the world economy in a way that addresses three objectives, not just the one objective. There are huge increases of income inequality in the major economies of the world. Brazil is one of the few places where income inequality has actually declined over the past 25 years because of the spread of primary and secondary education on a universal basis primarily. But in most other parts of the world, there's been a rising income inequality. The United States Gini coefficient is shown here. We really feel this income inequality and you see it in the streets of the United States these days, whether it's Ferguson, Missouri or New York City these past few days. Racial divides are as open and sore as ever. Income divides are wider than ever before. China also has had a huge increase of income inequality as an accompaniment of its rapid uh, industrialization of the last 30 years. There are several reasons for this growing divide. It's a very complicated analytical question where this comes from. There's no uh, simple consensus on this. I would mention the following. There have been rising economic returns to good skills, and so a rising gap between skilled and unskilled work. 
there is huge, and it's related, huge technological displacement of factory work in particular. Uh, political systems are highly corrupted uh, almost everywhere, and so policies are directed towards the wealthy. Uh, there is decreasing educational mobility of the poor in the United States and other countries because the cost barriers for higher education have become even larger than before. There's massive ecological losses incurred primarily by the poor because the poor live in more fragile ecological regions to begin with, and those regions are being hammered by climate change and by other environmental losses. And globalization of financial flows has opened up avenues for two kinds of problems. One, mega corruption, and second, a so-called race to the bottom, where different jurisdictions compete with each other by promising tax breaks and tax loopholes. Come here and work. You'll never pay a tax again. And we have that kind of race to the bottom taking place globally. All of this is, means that the social agenda at a time of unprecedented plenty is also growing rather than narrowing in important ways. And there's a lot of political instability uh, that uh, has resulted from this. And you can find it in Brazil. You can find it in the United States. You find it all over the world. For a while, every city I came to had a riot. And I thought it was a personal uh, greeting. <laughs> Uh, but uh, then I realized it wasn't really about me after all. Uh, it was a, a little bit more general than that. Um, but it is a very serious, uh, serious matter. Let me add that the population dynamics will exacerbate this problem in a few regions. Africa, parts of the Middle East, and parts of South Asia are demographically running out of control. Africa, in particular, is a demographic dynamic that is unprecedented and, I think, unmanageable. Uh, to give you the specifics, the UN estimate for 1950 is that sub-Saharan Africa had a population of 179 million people. 179 million. As of 2015, that will be 1 billion. So from 179, billion, 179 million to 1 billion. On the current mid-medium fertility scenario of the UN, that 1 billion increases to 3.9 billion by 2100, a twice doubling in the 21st century. I personally believe it's impossible for Africa to achieve sustainable development with four billion people. So my view is there would be a massive crisis implied by these fertility rates. There simply are not the resources, the water, uh, the uh, underlying uh, other resources, the ability of poor households to uh, give education to five or six children as needed if these current fertility rates remain. And I think the consequences would be very severe. But I can tell you this is almost not discussed in polite company anywhere in the world. Uh, the UN didn't mention it during the past two years of discussions about sustainable development goals. Almost no government takes it up. It's almost not mentioned at all. It's quite troubling. Uh, you can imagine the forces against men mentioning it. But it's a very, very serious problem. Now, I know I'm running late. If I could have 10, 10 minutes to finish, I hope. OK, sorry. Uh, let me just turn to the second dimension and try to be very quick. This is uh, more familiar. Uh, the fact that the world economy has reached the planetary boundary limits, I think, is now much uh, better appreciated than could have been uh, conveyed in 1972. And I believe that the concept of planetary boundaries is a very useful one. Uh, myself, I like it very much. Uh, and the emphasis on this range, in this case, in the 2009 famous article on the safe operating space for humanity in Nature magazine, uh, 10 areas were identified. 
climate change, biodiversity loss, nitrogen and phosphorus flux, ocean acidification, groundwater depletion, aerosol loadings, uh, chemical pollutants, uh, ozone depletion, and so on. These are all manifestations of a world economy that has grown so large relative to the finite ecosystems and that is driven by particular industrial processes that threaten the functioning of the ecosystems and by the fact that humanity appropriates roughly 50% of primary productivity on the planet now. So we clear pasture, we take cropland, uh, we pave over uh, land in order to feed 7.3 billion people in the way that uh, the industrial food system has them fed, which is uh, not a sustainable way either of eating or of, uh, of producing food. And so we have multiple simultaneous, complementary, overlapping, synergistic risks. And climate change is by far the most threatening and it's an imminent uh, disaster that is looming. And uh, all of you know this graph, we've reached 400 parts per million this year, a level of CO2 concentrations not seen on the planet for the last three million years. And everywhere I visited this year, starting with the meetings in Brazil early this year onward, every single stop I made, I was witness to environmental catastrophes ongoing. Already early in the year, we knew about the droughts in Sao Paulo, but the message was, shh, don't say anything about it. We have World Cup, we have elections, we don't want to talk about this. Uh, and that was uh, really the reality here. Then in Indonesia, uh, massive drought uh, and fires uh, in Sumatra. Uh, then when I was in uh, the Balkans, uh, in Belgrade, there were unprecedented one in 500 year floods uh, that came. In fact, they had never seen floods like they experienced there. California, worst drought in, uh, in modern history underway. Uh, a complete uh, loss of uh, the water reservoirs. Drought all over the world this year. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, in uh, the Mediterranean Basin, in the American West, in large parts of Brazil, in large parts of Southern Africa. Drought pervasive uh, this year. Huge floods. Uh, when I was in Japan uh, just uh, a few weeks ago, uh, also unprecedented uh, flooding. And we now have the hottest ever April, May, June, August, September, and October on record as of the 2015, 2014 uh, seasons. So the WMO announced yesterday its expectation that 2014 will be the hottest record uh, instrument year uh, in history. This seems very, very likely now. Uh, we have uh, a, uh, unprecedented uh, heat waves and an El Nino, weak El Nino, that is, uh, of course, amplifying this. We also have uh, plenty of emerging <coughs> zoonotic diseases, which are coming from climate change and new interfaces of human systems with the animal reservoirs and with the genetic recombination probably driven by industrial food production as well. Of course, there's a lot that's not known about this, but we have the Ebola outbreak, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, avian flu, and so on. So it's a big agenda. Uh, and there are many, many things to do to achieve sustainable development. I'll just put at the top of the list rapid technological transformation that decouples the economic system from a lot of the primary resource drivers. The number one eco ecological, uh, technological transformation needed by far can be simply stated but hard to achieve, and that is to decarbonize the world energy system on a time scale of 30 to 40 years unprecedentedly difficult because we have a world energy system that is fundamental for the world economy that has been built up over 200 years based on coal, oil, and gas. 
that runs 80% of its primary energy from fossil fuels, and we have 30 years to move decisively towards decarbonization. You could say, thank you very much, Professor Sachs, that's impossible, and that is a view that many people have, but it is a view, I think, that would be extraordinarily dangerous, and it's our responsibility to give a good answer to that. There are many, many other things that are uh, needed, but I need to move on. Just to say that, for me, it's critical that we adopt some clear goals. There is a working list of 17 goals, which is too long to be clear, I have to emphasize, uh, that the UN has taken up. We need to reduce that number sharply. For some reason, it was difficult to negotiate the 17, and governments are saying, we don't want to touch that. Brazil is one of the governments that says, don't touch the number. But there's a common understanding that if these goals are to be useful, the number has to come down, which, by the way, can work quite well with commas uh, and semicolons. Uh, so you can say, instead of goal on marine ecosystems and another goal on terrestrial ecosystems, you could say a goal on marine and terrestrial ecosystems and then tell sixth graders that we want to understand this, that's about ecosystems. Uh, and that would be an effective way to get the number down. I'm campaigning hard to reduce the number because I think we should have maximum 12 and ideally around 10 of these sustainable development goals. We need a major technological revolution, what's sometimes called the sixth Kondratiev wave, of moving towards sustainable technologies. I like this graph. These are the four main uh, representative concentration pathways of the IPCC, showing the business as usual concentration of greenhouse gas emissions in this upward line, which would be a four to six degree Celsius warming of the planet. And this is the emissions curve that we need globally to achieve the maximum of two degrees Celsius that has been agreed. Notice two things, three things. First, we have to peak by around 2020. Second, by mid-century, we have to be somewhere around 60% below the 2014 emissions level, which was 36 billion tons. And by around 2070, we have to be to net zero emissions. In other words, to stabilize greenhouse gases, you have to get to zero. And we need to be a net zero CO2 world economy within 50 years, roughly. That's a huge undertaking. It's feasible because it means moving from coal, oil, and gas to wind, solar, nuclear, advanced biofuels, carbon capture sequestration, hydro, geothermal, and other zero or near zero uh, energy sources, which are abundant if tapped properly. But it is a systems and an economic change that is phenomenally significant and very rapid and would have to be directed rather than expected simply to emerge out of market forces. Examples of reasons for success come back to the advances of the information age, in this case the semiconductor revolutions that have reduced by a factor 100 the cost of polysilicon photovoltaic cells. So they've come down from $70 a watt to 70 cents a watt between 1977 and 2014. That makes it possible to have mass solar energy worldwide tapped, but it requires massive systems organization as well. What are the critical priorities? Sustainable, meaning low cost, uh, low carbon reliable energy. Sustainable agriculture and nutrition, meaning food production systems that are much less burdensome on the physical environment than our current food systems, much more water uh, sparing, much more land sparing, and much more nutritious than the current staple grain focused uh, and beef focused systems. 
We need smart cities, which involves a lot of information technology put into the infrastructure of power, transport, uh, and uh, urban governance. We need universal access to the basic services of health and education, and these require technological breakthroughs, all of them. I'm a huge fan of the concept of directed technological change, meaning that science is not open-ended, curiosity-driven in significant part, but is directed by industrial needs or by societal needs. Now, by far the main driver, by far, in the last century has been the military. The military has purchased almost every early stage breakthrough technology to make it a feasible commercial technology. That's true of the computing age, because the first computer was built to simulate thermonuclear explosions by von, John von Neumann. They're not the first one, but effectively the first one. Uh, the semiconductor revolution came from NASA buying semiconductors throughout the 1960s to go to the moon. We need to have a similar mission-led process, but not driven by our military. That's the question for humanity. Can we do this not out of fear or out of power, will to power, but out of uh, instinct for survival and goodwill in a different way? But most people believe, and in America we're told every day, there's no such thing as technology, as driving technology, it's the geniuses of Steve Jobs or Bill Gates or others that drive technological change. This is an optical illusion that is not well understood because Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, no matter what they did, would not have been there had it not been for the computing age and uh, the invention of the semiconductors and the systematic application of science towards mission-driven problems on which these applied <laughs> solutions can be found. And we need to tell our governments they need to invest heavily in sustainable development solutions now. That means the whole value chain from basic science to direct application but they need to understand that whether it goes from vaccines, radar, cryptography, nuclear energy, computing, semiconductors, space science, internet, genomics, uh, 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 particle physics, uh, and uh, brain initiative, this is driven technology. We're saying we can do the following by harnessing science and engineering to solve human problems. So we need global public-private partnerships for low-carbon energy systems, resilient and sustainable agriculture, and I want to put the focus on both words. Resilient means resilient to the environmental crises, and sustainable means stop making new environmental crises from agriculture. And we need both of those concepts because the causation goes in both directions. Smart, ICT-enabled urban systems and ICT-enabled health education and good governance. To my mind, that's an agenda that is absolutely a practical agenda and a, and a big one. So 2015 is the decisive year. I think it's true to say it's the last chance for a safe climate. I mentioned quickly we need to re reinvigorate development assistance, adopt sustainable development goals, create a climate agreement based on the two degrees Celsius limit, ensure health and education for all, and bolster public-private partnerships for sustainable technologies. And finally, finally, the key roles of science in this agenda. It seems to me that the, I mentioned six. One, understanding the mechanisms. Of course, this is something that only scientific, uh, the scientific community can do the mechanisms of climate, biodiversity, economic dynamics, and so forth. Second, monitoring and mapping Earth systems, because we still have a huge fundamental observational challenge to know what's happening and to be able to measure fluxes uh, in Earth states uh, in uh, real time related to policy time. 
Third, develop better integrated systems frameworks for integrating human and Earth system processes. Economics lost the sense of geography and ecology about 150 years ago. So economics became a field divorced from physical nature. It's only in the last 20 years that economics as a field is re-embracing some basic concepts that there's energy, space, land, uh, ecology, and so on. And we need to bring the physical and the human and social sciences back together more effectively. Four, directed technological advancement. Five, institutional innovations to achieve sustainable development. And then six, and I want to end here, the scientific community is a global community. That by itself is of inestimable value. This is one of the only communities in the world that has a universal language. Maybe FIFA is the other one. Uh, and I think that the point that scientists in every part of the world could speak the same language and say to governments everywhere, this is real, this is important, we all share this. It doesn't matter religion, doesn't matter race, region, income level, we're all scientists and we all share the same common vision is incredibly important for humanity also to explain that this is a global challenge, not a sector or specific challenge and not an us versus them challenge. Thanks very much. And uh, so I want to make this pledge. We have uh, organizations of the Inter-Academy Panel, uh, the, the one uh, in Latin America, and so on. So the academies of science are very organized these days. And uh, they will be with you. Let's do it. And uh, uh, the dreams of uh, implementing all this uh, uh, very, very challenging uh, goals. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.